So the service type is uh, name here TCP and uh, it's served on port number 10110. Uh, this is a standard. Uh, on IANI's uh, website and uh, all communication is done through IP network using uh, socket communication and of course data is transferred uh, using uh, linear GG sentences. So what's next? Well, what's after I'm done with this project? Uh, we are thinking of implementing a GeoClue to GeoClue location sharing. That is, uh, if you have uh, a GPS on one uh, GeoClue device, you can transfer the location to the other location device, uh, other uh, GNOME device using uh, this GPLU to GPLU location sharing. Uh, or you need a separate application just like an Android one to transfer uh, name sentences again to the uh, name source. And uh, also merging this project with uh, Ninjas could be a possible uh, future. So thank you all.
trying to refactor this 20 years old code base, which has many interesting codes there, many <laughs> interesting features that I'm still trying to understand up to now. And hopefully we'll get rid of this, if it makes sense, right? And, well, this code is already mer merged on master, just came master, and it will land on 3.18. So that's it, guys. I hope you, you're enjoying the, the work that you <laughs> will be used to show this one. In the first one, there will be a, 
uh, kind of the name, the name of the law. And, uh, and the second row, there will be the message, the detailed message. So, and this is the upper cache. So we can see, this is very uh, clear, we can see that. So why do we change it? It's very clear. For the cache, you can see every log entry is uses two, two rows. And it's, uh, how to say, every log entry just uh, uses too much uh, space. And so using, using single row to show this, we can uh, in the same size of window, in the, in the same size of a window, we can see more block entries. So this is why we change it. So coming to the second one is a new feature that is view logs from previous proofs. <coughs> and this is the screenshot of the after patch. And you can see that there was uh, on the top top right there was a menu button and a pop up window. Pop up menu is shown there. <coughs> there was five uh, mm -hmm. time you can on those. Well, clicking uh, one, you can see the and over here you can see the logs and the log, log entry will change. Uh, before the patch, you can only view the current boot through the GNOME logs, but it is very limited. But some someone I want to see some uh, previous boots, so. Before the patch, you cannot do this, but after the patch, right now we only uh, uh, have the option to let the user choose the uh, latest five uh, latest five boots. But uh, you will be available uh, sometime later to let the user to access all the boots. So that will be pretty good. Okay, so let's go to the third one. The third one is also a new feature that is to improve the search by using Google Cloud. Combinations. Uh, so, before the patch, uh, what do we search as a search text? We may uh, we may uh, uh, input and uh, get the entry, search entry directly as maybe we type system D, TBPD, disable or device, and, and the and some relevant uh, entries will show up. Uh, after patch and the search will, uh, search will logs will become very powerful. And we can see that uh, maybe, maybe some of you, uh, maybe many of you has ever used uh, journal CTL and the search of journal CTL is very powerful. But before the patch, the non blocks cannot do, uh, do the same functionality as the journal, uh, journal CTL. So after patch, we can also do uh, the, the search like this one. And this will show the uh, messages whose common field is PPPD and whose uh, message field is disabled or whose common field is system B and whose message field is device. So uh, by using this uh, logical and logical or this uh, and Boolean combinations and this will make the search of the loss very powerful. And so this is why we improve this feature. So that's all. Thanks. Checkbox. 
And also, uh, boxes being important, like this, like you can see Fedora 22, uh, but we are, which are not getting installed but imported, were so far rendered uh, only as a black box. Now they are rendered as a gray box, just as you can see the other one, but with the spinner. I am also working on a list view. I hope it will be merged uh, for this cycle. Uh, so I'm very proud of what I did so far. I think it looks pretty nice. Once again, it's thanks to Jacob's design. Um, I learned a lot thanks to this because I learned uh, a lot about CSS theming in GTK, especially to make the thumbnails work and the widget states and words, stuff like that. It was very interesting. Um, I hope it will be really useful. I think it, it is. We got more information and it takes place, the space. I also, I also worked on uh, filters, pre-made filters, which allow you to see your local and remote machines. Uh, they are defined either if there are virtual machines that you created in, in boxes, they will be local, and if they are, are in the local namespace, they will also be considered local. I also worked on refactoring the wizard for creating the boxes and it has been kind of complicated because the pages, <laughs> the pages in the wizard are were kind of like one big widget, more or less, and the code was really intricate and lots of behavior, different behaviors in the find. And I really I try to split every behavior into several pages. I more or less did it. More or less. There's still work to be done, but I think it, the refactoring by itself may be good for the cycle, but you won't see any difference. It will only be cool. Uh, other than that, uh, the general idea was to port the actual, and the actual result to, GT, to use GTK assist, assistant. Um, uh, once refactoring will be done, it, will be trivial, it should be trivial to do. I also try to improve the usage of MIME types in boxes. So you could, so you can, you could open a file like an ISO or a QCAL2 file. And I failed. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I encountered a pretty weird bug, at least it's really weird for me. Uh, I tried to change the desktop entry of boxes to, uh, to set the mind type field. And I could set uh, an ISO, for example, to launch directly with boxes. But boxes didn't launch. At all. Uh, I tried several stuff. The, the trying to launch the ISO directly uh, on the command line worked, except when you tried XDG open. Uh, it was the same, it didn't work at all. But when I rename boxes the sub entry to something simpler, uh, I don't know why, boxes started to launch, but without opening the, the ISO, it was pretty weird. I really don't understand. If anybody understands this, please contact me. I want to fix this. <laughs> Thanks. Hi and good evening everyone. <coughs> I'm Andrew Macabre. I'm going to talk about long key sign. What is long key sign? Well, uh, it's a tool for signing uh, open PGP keys in an easier way. Uh, that started as an idea in the last uh, summer, in Google Summer of 20, uh, 2014. And uh, the idea was proposed by my mentor, Tobias Miller. Uh, what it does, it 
it uh, allows to securely exchange the OpenBGP keys without uh, needing to contact the key server. Uh, it assigns each UID of the keys individually and allows to send encrypted signatures back to the key owner uh, using the default, uh, the default uh, mail user engine. Uh, what happened from last release, uh, from last uh, Google Sound Code, uh, the second release? with a new wizard list uh, UI for the server side, um, a full screen QR code window, uh, widgets that are easier, easier to reuse, and uh, it now can bind to IPv6 sockets also. Uh, how it looks? Uh, well, it, sure, it looks simple. Uh, here the user wants to get one uh, of, his key, of his keys signed, and he selects the key and uh, then he gets this uh, key fingerprint or the QR code generator. Uh, the other user who wants to sign uh, the first user, uh, the user X key, uh, he goes to the second tab and uh, he can type the fingerprint or can use the camera to scan the QR code. Okay. Uh, what happens in the, what what I'm working in the Google Summer Code 2015? Um, I wanted to make the donkey sign application GNOME ready. So I replaced uh, some of the dependencies that made it uh, harder to distribute, uh, some weird dependencies. Uh, I made a new GPG library, to, in a new, uh, Python GPG library that can interact with GPG. Uh, added support for internationalization and localization. Uh, this, yes, this made it uh, easier to even easier to use in your uh, language now that you can translate. Uh, build test suite for major program components, and uh, uh, now I'm working on the on making the uh, file transfer more secure by uh, setting up an encrypted link. And uh, last part to switch to GTK Builder and design uh, interfaces. The interface uh, a lot easier. What's uh, next? Soon it will be a new, a third uh, release, and uh, probably on official GNOME no repository. Now we're posting on uh, GitHub, and uh, we'll integrate it with the GNOME no desktop platform. All right, this was. I'm oh, sorry. This was my time. Thank you. Out all the results from Kuala 
into a, a JSON format. Now this JSON can be passed by any other programming language into whatever data structure you want and can be used pretty easily. Also one more thing which I worked on during the summer was continuous integration in Koala. So it is already there, I was just enhancing it a bit. So we have a pretty nice system in Koala where um, how the workflow works is that any developer makes a full request on GitHub and GitHub is already configured with a few tools like Travis, Scrutinizer and so on. And these run on the pull request, the patch master basically, and it checks your code. So we have uh, Linux testing using Circle CI. We have oh, Mac testing using Travis. Windows testing using AppWare. And also we have Scrutinizer for checking code quality. So you know it tells you we have very complex functions and so on. And the last one is coverage. So coverage is you know while you're testing it just checks every line has been checked or not. Also one nice tool which we've been using in Koala very recently is Ralter. R-U-L-T-O-R. So what Ralter does is that it makes it very easy for you to merge your code bases and make releases. So let's say if you have a pull request. Normally you have to check if it's possible to rebase it and so on and so forth. So Ralter has a very easy way of, you know, you just type something like at Ralter space merge and it will try to merge it. And you can choose some rules like this, this should not give any conflict with earlier codes and so on and so forth. Also one more thing we do with Ralter is that we update our translations using Zenata before it merges. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Hi, I am Odeya Tandem and I was working on a GUI for Koala. So that's that's the logo that we are really proud of. So I started my work with designing or working on a prototype. And when the motivation for a prototype was that we really did not know when we started where we wanted to take this GUI and what what features we wanted to wanted in it. So, and also we wanted to see that can we pull data from Koala and display it in a GTK based GUI. And also, I mean, every day during the design the prototype, we've made new feature decisions that have been added. So, this is, this is the results view in the prototype. And as you can see, this uses GTK source view and is also pulls results from Koala and displays it here. And you can see that you can also do actions on it. If you press it, no, it will just delete the result. And this is this is pretty much what we want to do in the final GUI. So the final GUI. So the need for a final GUI. So I think we use a GUI to make it more intuitive to the users and to make the functions more clear so that everything is visible. And it's also easy for the beginners to use. So when I started coding, I was not immediately comfortable with the terminal environment, which essentially Koala is right now. And I think for beginners, as I was beginning, I remember I used to do 15, 20 force pushes on my code to just get it correct. And also in the GUI, we want a continuous integration style updation of results. So what we want to do is that every five seconds or 10 seconds, we want to check the code base and we want to see if it has been updated and then we want to update the results on the go so that they're just available whenever you go to the GUI. So challenges that I had, I think that what designing a GUI from scratch, there are really little problems that I face and especially because it's in Python, I also face a lack of resources for GDK3 in Python. And open source contribution is really something new to me. I just started in February and all thanks to Lassie that I'm here and he's been a really great mentor. <laughs> also testing and maintaining 100% coverage, even if one statement is not covered, you can pretty much guarantee that Lassie will reject that <laughs> pull request. Yeah, and I have had some issues with GDK3. So this is like the only thing right now that is completely ready in my GUI and I have like ripped it off of Builder and 
Christian has really helped me on the IRC to get this at least ready by now. Thank you. Judge me or I don't know. Don't judge me. I'd like to take a selfie with all of you in the background. <laughs> Oh my god, it's the Oscars! <laughs> yeah, yeah, I said that we are talking. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Uh, my band name is uh, Astia and I've been working a bit on enhancing the chatting experience in an RC client. And uh, the RC client is Polari. Uh, it's been around for a while and uh, made initially by my mentor, Florian. Um, and uh, I've been uh, working on a variety of uh, things here and there to uh, improve it and uh, I'll go through some of the few of them that I managed to successfully uh, implement. Uh, one of the first things uh, which is already based in the unstable uh, release of GNOME at the moment is the initial uh, setup and um, it started out, uh, well this is how it looks in GNOME 3.16 and it's not, uh, well I guess not particularly user friendly uh, so I added some identity to this window and some labeling, so it becomes sort of like a little tour. You is asked uh, to add a new connection. You open the connection dialog. Oh, I have to use the plus button. All right, that's nice. And now I can join the group using the plus button. Uh, another thing I've been looking into is to create a room menu. Uh, and the idea of this uh, room menu is to uh, give each room a status. So you can see, you know, what channel modes are available, uh, am I connected securely, and so forth. And also give you some options as to, for example, if you want to change the topic in case you have permission to do that, or if you want to leave the room for that case. Um, at the moment, this is how the implementation looks, but it, it should have uh, be pretty versatile uh, to have more uh, content in the future. Uh, another thing I've been looking into has been. Uh, status uh, hiding, uh, which is this uh, interesting concept of uh, removing all this, uh, these, some of these garbage messages you see a lot, for example, when you're on Debian on a very active day, uh, then pretty much 80% of your chat view is covered in someone has disconnected and someone else has joined. And yeah. So the first thing I've been looking into is uh, how can you uh, only show the relevant uh, status messages? So I have uh, one commit that kind of goes in and looks at, so who's activating the channel right now? Okay, that's probably the interesting users to actually emit status messages from them. Secondly, uh, if the channel is not active, is that if there's no conversation going on, we compress the status messages instead so that uh, the well, 36 uh, status messages become one line that you can expand uh, any time in history. Uh, this is not merged or anything yet, and should probably go on a design review, but it's some uh, plain I've been doing. Then uh, we now support, uh, well, in the branch I have, we now support uh, opening IRC links. Uh, if you browse around the internet, then uh, when you go some different places, you will find an IC link and Polari will now register itself and uh, you can use Polari to open these uh, links. You'll get this uh, little connection dialog if you haven't connected to the server before. So you just enter your nickname and you should be right off to the channel you might have uh, connected to. This is uh, another thing I've been working on and this is uh, basically error handling. Um, we are now showing uh, connecting uh, notifications over in the sidebar of the root list instead. And uh, if we encounter an error, we show this little funky error icon. 
and uh, if you happen to be watching a channel that is uh, showing or having an error, then uh, we'll also uh, emit a notification for you. For example, if you are unable to connect to Reno, we'll uh, uh, show this uh, error message and an action to edit the account and give some extra details, uh, and then highlight the field that might be uh, wrong, for example, if you misspelled the address. Uh, then we also uh, have some another type of error where there might be a, a problem uh, with uh, establishing a secure connection where we ask, you know, do you actually care for this particular server if the connection is secure or, uh, you know, should we just leave like this? And finally, if you uh, happen to be banned from a room, uh, for example from Nautilus, then uh, we also show a notification for this. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's it. stuff like um, scaling and rotating and um, also has uh, things like you can tell it to uh, restrict the angle to 90 degree steps which is common in uh, image viewers yeah it's a yeah, displays a normal image and um, in the usual case it does not keep a keep a GDPX buff around it instead only a Cairo surface Unless it's an animation, in which case you just need an animation. Um, we have uh, asynchronous ways to load the image from streams or from, from a file. Yeah, scale and angle properties, of course. Um, in the future, probably touchpad gestures, hopefully. And um, normal gestures for your um, touch screen. Um, GK image has this problem with um, high DPI and scale factors, which we want to avoid. So if you load any image from disk and uh, tell GK image to this that um, you want or you designed it to be uh, a scale 2 image, then um, you will not scale it up if your display is also scale 2. Um, yeah, we can scale the surface to fit the widget allocation or uh, scale the image to fit, uh, no, scale the widget to fit the image. And what I'm currently working on is the uh, scale to mouse pointer thing where uh, the image view is in a scroll window and you're scrolling at uh, the scale using the mouse, but you don't want to. Like that would increase the size and so everything would move to the lower right, but you don't want that, so we need to scale go to the lower uh, upper left. Yes, because it's a, um, it's a GDK scrollable and a GDK widget subclass. And I think that's it. And I have a, a work in progress branch if you want to check that out. Unless I put something stupid like last time. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, and my mentor is Sebastian Droga. I worked this year on the GStreamer debugger. I suppose everyone knows what GStreamer is, so I won't talk about it. Uh, I use GStreamer very often, almost daily, and I 
almost always had the same problem. Uh, I wanted to know what's going on on specific path. I, I mean, what kind of events, what kind of queries, what buffers are going through there, and I wasn't able to do it using GStreamer logs. So I, I have this problem with uh, probes, but it was very inconvenient because I, if I wanted to spy watching another part, I need to rec recompile my application. So that was problematic. And that's why I started uh, my own project, GStreamer Debugger. I also decided to allow uh, the client to to have an access through the internet connection to uh, to the server to the debugging server. So if I have uh, my application running on um, some embedded device, I, I have an access to all this data uh, through the TCP IP protocol. Okay. So that's the solution. Uh, my project consists of two parts. The first part is uh, uh, is a server, it's implemented as GST Trace plugin. The GST Trace module is not implemented in the current stable, which is your version, but it will be in the future. Uh, and the client, client side is a GTK Plus application, it looks like that. So, the most important features. Uh, at first, you are able to watch uh, the pipeline topology, so I mean all the elements or, or all beans uh, of your pipeline are available in the application. You can get inside uh, the specific bean, uh, show, view all parts or elements inside the bean. Um, the second feature, um, properties. You can both uh, watch the properties, watch the property values, and uh, change these values as well. Uh, what's the most important? You don't have to uh, install all elements which uh, are used in a server-side application because all the properties are sent uh, from the server to the client. Uh, all types of these properties are sent, so you don't have to know nothing about uh, elements in your client-side application. Mm. The other feature uh, log messages, so you have an access to, uh, to all logs uh, of GStreamer. Events uh, are also available. Uh, you can select the path, uh, you can select uh, event type. Uh, you are also able to watch uh, bus messages, uh, buffers as well, but I don't recommend it if you uh, have a lot of data in these buffers. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Oliver Law and uh, I'm one of this year's Google South Coast students and I'm working on uh, a tiny bit uh, part of the evolution. And my mentor is uh, it's David Woodhouse, and he's not here today. So uh, let me introduce uh, something of my project. Uh, first, I'll tell you something about my project. It's called Evolution Active Sync. And then uh, something about my work is about two migrations from the e plugin to the extensions and from the GCOM to the G settings. And the last, I'll tell you something about our future works. Uh, first about our project, uh, Evolution Active Sync. Uh, it's a backend for Evolution that support the uh, uh, Microsoft Exchange Active Sync. It's a kind of protocol that would, would do the synchronization of some uh, of many stuff like emails, contacts, or something. And uh, it is largely used. Uh, it is using Exchange servers like Officer three hundred and sixty five. And it was using Google, and I guess it's some stuff between Google and Microsoft, so it's not so good yet, not so good now. Uh, but you can still access the ex Google, some stuff with the existing configurations, but 
I think that, that new account is not allowed. And uh, it's about my work. My first work is a migration from a plugin to an extension. Uh, so the e plugin is the API used to extend evolution so that the user can configure, configure their accounts using the uh, GUI provided by evolution. But it's fabricated and uh, the last work version is evolution 3.4 and after that uh, the users of our project can only configure their accounts by command line so it's kind of um, convenient. So I just migrate the uh, project to the new API called the extension and we bring back the GUI configuration to a user. And the uh, next work is the migration from the GCOM to the G settings. Uh, as, we, as we know, GCOM is uh, kind of uh, things to store user accounts information and it's deprecated. So uh, I just migrate, migrate our project from GCOM to the new API called G7s and it just work well, works well. And uh, let's talk some future works. Uh, uh, first, uh, we have to handle the we have to handle the password things. We just now uh, we just spawn the SSH ask pass now to ask the user the password. But uh, we actually get a password through the evolution itself, so we could work on that. And uh, uh, next stuff is some version control works. Since we only have a massive branch now and we don't have any versions. So I guess we have to do some version controls and we can re release some stable versions so that we can make some checkpoint or something like that. And uh, uh, that's all of my report. I, I wish uh, my work would help other people. Uh, thank you. some USB devices based on some criteria. Uh, before starting any project, I think we should ask some, we should ask, uh, ask ourselves some questions like, uh, why do this? Well, s some USB devices may be dangerous. They can contain the viruses or some greater hackers can uh, rewrite a firmware from that, uh, for that device and make uh, hit under power devices or, net, or we could have network trust issues. Uh, this is because they rewrite that firmware and when we connect or they connect that device, uh, we should uh, get something we are not destined to have in our computer and that could cause some problems. Uh, the next question is how do we do, how do, we do this? And this is pretty simple. Uh, first, we should, uh, let's say, disable the driver's auto-binding system from Linux. And doing that, we could simply write zero in some specific file. Uh, sorry. Uh, then we could, uh, we should uh, uniquely identify each device. And for that, we, we ask Linux about the device descriptors. Like, uh, device descriptor, configuration descriptor, interface descriptor, and endpoint descriptors. And uh, having that, we could uh, say if a device is, I don't know, USB mass storage or heat device or uh, webcam or something else. Then uh, writing a debug that uh, kicks in when the uh, screen saver uh, appears. Uh, here, we, we only listen for a signal from our non screen saver. And uh, using this, we, uh, how I said, write zero in a specific file for drivers auto uh, that drivers auto binding shouldn't work, and then monitor each inserted device. And for this, I used file dev. Uh, when I connect a device, I ask for some information about the, that device. I ask another device, but Linux, about the information cache. And, uh, then, based on that, I should uh, bind the driver to that device or no? 
and uh, for the configuration or for the device, device descriptors, I use PyUCB. And here we have in the second column we have an example an example for from uh, when USB mass storage. And let's say we want to block uh, this USB mass storage. We first should look at the uh, uh, the device class, and if it's zero, then each interface the device can have more interfaces. Each interface specifies its functionality, and here we can see that uh, uh, the interface class is mass storage. And if it's something that we want to block, then we block. Else, uh, we block it, leaving the driver out, uh, not bind. But if you want to bind it, then we seem to find it. So that was it. Thanks. Hello, hello everyone. My name is uh, Julian, and this summer I've been working on uh, Nibble modernization. My mentor is uh, Michael Catanzaro. Uh, first of all, uh, for the, those of you that don't know, uh, Nibble is a um, Snake game for GNOME. Uh, the game's goal is to collect as many bonuses as possible while avoiding the other uh, worms and the walls. And it also has support for multiplayer, up to six players, but uh, only four human players. Uh, short summary I uh, had to port the game to Vala from C. Uh, while doing that, I had to rethink the worm data structure, that was the root cause of uh, most of our problems and crashes. And also, I had to give the game an updated look, which we'll be able to show or see on the next slides. Uh, it's based on uh, some mockups made by, by uh, Alan Day. So on the left, you can see the game before the port to Vala, and on the right, you can see the updated look. Uh, a new uh, retro archaic style look. And also, on the bottom of the screen, you can um, see an updated uh, scoreboard that uh, allows you to easily distinguish between your lives on the bottom row and the score for uh, each one. Uh, also, I added some uh, pre-game screens that will give you some basic information and uh, also allow you to configure some uh, basic settings for the game you're about to play. The first screen, uh, you'll see this one uh, when you first run the game, it will give you a basic description of the game. Uh, on the right, you'll be able to choose the number of players for the current game. Uh, based on the number of players uh, you choose, you will see the controls for each player. And uh, right before starting uh, the game, and the, each level actually, you'll uh, be able to see the screen, which uh, gives you a short uh, countdown on the bottom of the screen, and also some um, nameplates so easily be able to identify your, uh, your board. Uh, in conclusion, the game is now much easier to hack on, especially if, you're, uh, if you also want to put it to other uh, normal games. Uh, it has a similar uh, structure. Uh, besides that, uh, the user now uh, have a better experience. Firstly, by, by an um, updated UI, and uh, also because uh, we also fixed most, uh, most of the crashes. And that's everything. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Alessandro Bono. I'm from Italy. And this summer I've been working on a, a new collection of dialogue for GNOME documents. So uh, I was mentored by uh, the Bashi Ray. And this is uh, why do we need a uh, new collection dialogue? Uh, this uh, is a picture of the current dialogue and uh, it has uh, a collection list uh, in Italy and it, is, it isn't well readable. The way you add a new collection isn't good because uh, if you write a name and then click on the list, it will add a collection anyway. And also, there isn't a way to prevent duplicates and this. And lastly, the dialogue lacks of the capability to uh, 
René Ima or Delete an Existing Collection. Uh, the new dialogue, new dialogue is intended to solve uh, these problems and it looks like this. It has a more readable collection list and uh, you can uh, uh, check, check, you, you can click uh, on the road to check it. Uh, you can uh, rename or delete a collection by clicking on the hamburger menu on the right. Uh, we can now prevent uh, uh, illegal entries uh, like to create and by, by disabling the down button and or the add button when uh, we add our name or collection. And if uh, the user wants to delete the collection, instead of display a, a, a confirmation dialog, we uh, immediately apply the deleting, but we, the user can roll it, roll it back by clicking the answer button. My name is Magdalene Burns and I'm working on developing um, Java ATK wrapper and my mentor is Federico Minna. Um, it's much less visual <laughs> project because it's um, um, for Orca screen reader users rely on Orca's voice to navigate the desktop um, and Orca needs um, the GNOME's ATK to allow it to speak GTK app widgets and Windows. Um, but when Orc is using a Java application, um, it needs the Java ATK wrapper um, as a bridge between um, AWT events and Swing widgets. So, um, so um, just a bit of background, um, a company called Sun contributed the wrapper to GNOME in 2009. It was mainly developed by Kay Wang until 2011. Um, and then between 2011 and 2004, it was kind of abandoned. Um, and then uh, me and Ali, Ali Hundra did a bit of work on it, and then I became the maintainer. So it was pretty, pretty broken and pretty outdated, and it also um, needed more stuff to, to, to make a, a, a complete package, because it was never really completely sort of implementing everything that it needed to do, and I've just done something. Oh, what was that? Uh, oh, okay. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, so just, just a outline of it. Um, it's organised um, as a uh, Java library and a C library, two separate subfolders. They, you've got the wrapper, which um, <coughs> uh, the wrapper, which listens to AWT events, um, and then um, adapts um, um, JA API um, to ATK interfaces, and then you've got um, JNI, which is in written in C. Um, and it converts um, AWT events to G-signals and implements ATK class and interface um, pointers. Right, uh, so, okay, we're calling the native functions in C. So, essentially it calls Java functions in C, with J and I. Um, okay, so, what, so for my project, what needs to be done is, um, um, I want to implement uh, um, class and interface pointers from ATK, which haven't been, which haven't been implemented, not um, um, sort of converting anything to Java, so they're missing from the wrappers library. Um, but it also along the way, it's about fixing many bugs as well. Um, why did I give myself that sentence? <laughs> um, so it's uh, working with ATK, JNI, Glib, um, GTK. Um, J JN API and uh, and uh, being a module maintainer has its le learning curves. So, I mean, I've maintained uh, modules, but not not only for myself, not not with GNOME. So this is the first time for me. Um, so so I've, I've got a lot of learning curves to go through. And so implementing the pointer functions really helps me to learn the libraries better and get uh, get more familiar. Um, so so far, what I've done is I've 
fix the number of crashes and, and other bugs that have been reported either by me or, or, or some users. Um, and um, I've, impre <laughs> uh, I've improved the build and um, most of the functions that are on my list have been checked off my list now. So um, I've actually started looking into tests because testing it's uh, testing events much easier than testing these um, implementers. Um, so I'm, I'm looking into to that to make um, a, a, a bit at the moment before I go back to finishing some more of those. Um, and I'm also looking into um, what other AWT events um, should be converted into G signals with G, uh, J and I, um, as there's quite a few that are still missing. Um, right, thank you for listening.